So the, the talk um, is a robotic assisted radical prostatectomy and what's going to happen in southern Calgary uh, with this. Um, just to uh, give you my unbiased kind of opinion, uh, you know, my partner back in Kingston told everyone in urology that I was seduced by a robot. So uh, he was saying I'm a robot lover. Now, that's only one of the reasons I came to Calgary. Uh, but, you know, obviously I'm probably pro-robot. Uh, if I came to Calgary. Um, basically, what we're going to go through here is what's happened with prostatectomy uh, over the past decades, and then kind of put the robot into context into what uh, the robot offers new, uh, show you, you know, what the robot can actually do with some, some short clips of video, and then basically get down to, you know, what the literature currently says about what the robot can offer over traditional open prostatectomy or laparoscopic prostatectomy. Now, what we're looking at here are the different options in terms of treatment. You know, 30 or 40 years ago, everyone who had their prostate removed went to the, internal, went to the intensive care unit uh, because they needed uh, blood transfusions and, and a portion of people died. Uh, nowadays, it'd be the rare exception that goes to the in intensive care unit. Uh, mostly because this doctor named Patrick Walsh uh, described the anatomic uh, way to correctly remove a prostate. And that's basically what we've been doing for the last 20, 30 years, is making sure that we control the bleeding before we remove the prostate, make sure we can see what we're doing when we're doing the open surgery. Now more recently, probably in, in the last 10 or 15 years, uh, there's a, a French physician who popularized laparoscopic radical prostatectomy. Um, this is a very technically difficult operation, but he probably routinely does it, you know, in an hour to two hours. Um, and now he's at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, and then more recently, uh, the robot-assisted radical prostatectomy uh, has come along. Now this is kind of an industry-driven technology as opposed to something developed by a physician they actually got technology from NASA and also came up with a lot of different patents uh, and basically have the market. Uh, there's no really competing robot at this time or uh, surgical you know, innovation that uh, is on par with the Da Vinci. So if you think of it, you know, how many people here play golf? or at least know what golf clubs look like. So if you think of it like golf clubs, you know, what we used to do was with the old persimmon woods, you know, maybe you'd be able to hit it 150 yards and it might go straight, it might not. The biggest change has really been, you know, metal woods or metal clubs. Uh, you know, is the Da Vinci, you know, the graphite club or, you know, the, the next piece of technology that we should be looking towards in terms of helping us uh, remove people's prostates. You know, some people argue that it is. Other people argue that it's just a marketing tool. Uh, there's pros and cons to both. So basically, what is this Da Vinci robot? There's a company uh, in California uh, that, you know, their whole business is basically marketing and selling the robot. The robot uh, is the, 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 you know, the thing with the many arms with the, with the table there. Uh, and then there's a screen console for a nurse, and then you can have one or two consoles for the actual surgeon. So I trained in San Francisco during my fellowship, and you know, this is a, a quaint story, but basically we had a medical student visiting from another center, and they saw the robot doing the surgery, and they said, you know, so how does a robot know where to cut? And you know, we, had to, we, we thought they were joking around, and we said, oh, that's funny. Uh -huh. And she's like, no, seriously, how does a robot know where to cut? Um, that's not how the robot works. The doctor is still doing the operation, uh, but, you know, he controls the arms. So, realistically, uh, sorry, one second here. Let me get back to the technology is great if, if it's working all right. Okay, so we'll get back here. Okay, so if... You know, if you think about it, you know, it's just another tool. Uh, it's not like the robot's actually going to do your surgery. You still have a surgeon doing your surgery. Uh, that's the bottom line. What are the advantages of the robot? So in the top left-hand uh, part of the screen, you can see that uh, 
there's a, a console and you don't actually hold instruments in your hand, the surgeon is actually holding on to um, a robot arm that controls the arm on the inside of the patient. Uh, and it actually has scaling. So if you move, for example, 10 centimeters, uh, which seems like a lot, the robot arm on the inside might only move two centimeters. The advantage to that is you have a lot uh, more ability to do finer, minute movements over millimeters. Uh, in addition, it actually takes out some of the surgeon's tremor. So if a surgeon has a tremor, uh, laparoscopically you can see that, but the da Vinci will actually get rid of most of that. The other advantage uh, is 3, 3D vision. So it, it's not like 3D at the movies, but it's a slight three-dimensional vision, so you can actually kind of have depth perception within the body as opposed to just a 2D view, like you're watching television when we do most laparoscopic surgery. The biggest change is really uh, the fact that you have what's called an endo wrist. So in classic uh, laparoscopic surgery, most of our instruments are like chopsticks. They don't bend at all. You put them in and you can move them in and out and you can move them up, down, left, right, but you can't really move your wrist in. The robot actually has a wrist in place so you can actually do things with a robot that you cannot do laparoscopically. The dual console is really more for teaching. And in terms of the surgeon, you know, we like it because it's more ergonomic. You know, removing lots of prostates, you, you kind of bend your neck a lot and, you know, there's a chance of actually injuring yourself with a suture or a scalpel. Um, you don't get to sit down, you're standing the whole time. So a lot of older surgeons are saying this is really extending my lifetime as a surgeon because you know I'm sitting in a console and it's more ergonomic for me. However, that's, it's not totally relevant to you folks as the audience, it's more relevant to the surgeons. We know that the robot is extremely popular uh, in the United States. They have over 900 installations of the robot, which is basically three times the collective uh, robot uh, in the rest of the world. And it is marketed for different indications, but urology is by far and away uh, where the robot is being used the most and for radical prostatectomies. So you can see over the years, the number of procedures is, you know, it's almost 200,000 is what they estimate for uh, this, this last year. And it'll probably be more in 2010. This latest, in a, latest version of the, of the Da Vinci, which is what we're going to obtain uh, probably in January or February, uh, is a four-armed robot. So one of the arms is actually just a telescope with the three-dimensional vision. There's two working arms, and there's a fourth arm that the surgeon controls. Um, it doesn't seem like a big difference between three and four arms, but there really is a huge difference, uh, mostly because if you do a purely laparoscopic procedure, you're very dependent on your assistant. So, you know, you could be a great surgeon, but you need, really need a great assistant uh, for it to really be a, a slick procedure. If you have a, a forearm da Vinci, the surgeon controls most of the variables. And as a surgeon myself, I know that, you know, we're, we're kind of obsessive compulsive, so we like to have as much control as we can. So we see this as an advantage. The other thing, just like your TVs, we got upgraded from 720p to 1080i. Um, so the digital view is, is nice. Uh, and, you know, there's a, there's a few other changes they made, but generation to generation doesn't really make too much of a difference. If you look at, you know, the biggest impact in terms of technology, the robot in the U.S. probably is the biggest change. Um, if you're a hospital without a robot, uh, because uh, it's a market-driven economy, it's, but even for healthcare, you know, you're seen as a lesser hospital than hospitals with robots. Now, if you look at all the top cancer hospitals, everyone's got a da Vinci. If you look at all the top urology hospitals, everyone's got a da Vinci as well. Almost everyone, you know, UCSF or Harvard or, you know, pick anywhere, they all have robots. If you look at the installation, Year by year, it's gone you know, from almost nothing over the last 10 years to over 900. So there's, there's a lot of robot installation going on. In Canada, uh, not so much. So a lot less impressive uh, in terms of what's happening. 
probably because you know we're under a single payer system where Alberta Health or OHIP or whoever they have to pay the bills. So um, you know most of these robot installations, and this is the list of where they are, are actually on the basis of donor money. So the robot will cost about a million dollars a year over five years. So that's a that's a fair chunk of change. A million dollars a year, you know. Stephen Duckett would probably say, well, I don't want to pay for that. Um, and that's part of the reason that donor money is, is probably what's going to install the, uh, the robot in Calgary, much like the green light laser story. So uh, before you get bored, I thought I'd show you a little video of, of what the robot can actually do. So this is a, a few snippets of how the operation goes. Uh, we usually start by dissecting out the seminal vesicles. So this is actually underneath the bladder. And you can see the robot here is working with a hook. Uh, the vision for the surgeon is actually better than what you're seeing here. So they're stopping a bleeder. Uh, in this area, that's a seminal vesicle that's being dissected out. Uh, this is the vas. Go on to the next one. So after you dissect those out, this is the, the three minute prostatectomy. Uh, you incise the peritoneum. So you take uh, the bladder down is basically what's happening here. And you can see the the robot is actually, you can see the, the hook curving uh, to make it easier for them. And they're going to, I think, come through the, the vas deferens here in a second. Um, right about, uh, well, maybe they're not. There it is. So that's the vas being cut there. Uh, this part's not too exciting. Uh, so you, develop, you drop the bladder down, and then we develop what's called a working space. Uh, so now the robot is actually dropped the bladder down, and we're dissecting out what, what we call the space of Retzius, so we can actually see the prostate. So you can see the, the robot uh, is working nicely here under the control of the surgeon uh, to you know, move the tissues and burn them at the same time. Um, we clear off what's called the endopelvic fascia to access the prostate. So this is just taking down some fat and some small veins. That's the midline there. So even if you had open surgery, uh, the steps may not be in the same order, but this is probably what happened to you uh, if you had your prostate removed, just to keep you folks interested. If you haven't had surgery, uh, Something like this would happen if you had uh, your prostate removed. So now you can see that white filmy layer uh, that would go along with uh, the endopelvic fascia, which we have to incise to remove the prostate. So, so now that's going to be cut. After we do that, uh, so this is a, a, what happens when we open it up. Uh, laparoscopically, you probably do have less bleeding because the veins are compressed. Uh, because we're insufflating carbon dioxide into the abdomen. So one of the advantages here is uh, the veins will actually move away from you a little bit uh, and they will stay compressed so you don't have as much uh, loss of blood. So this is incising the endopelvic fascia. The prostate's to this area and then the levator muscles uh, are going to be in this area. Just to, It's a little bit confusing. So this is a, the dorsal venous complex. Uh, this is nicely uh, dissected out. This is the biggest area where you can have bleeding. Uh, in this case, sometimes we, usually we use a suture, but in this example of a video, they're using a stapler, uh, which has three lines of staplers on each side, uh, and then a knife that cuts in between. So you place it on the dorsal venous complex, or you place a stitch on the dorsal venous complex. This is the prostate underneath, and now that's being placed. And hopefully there's no bleeding. And they fire the stapler. And it looks good. Of course, for the example video, we're not going to show you when, where things went awry. Uh, OK, so now so the uh, dorsal venous complex is taken nicely. You see the urethra there. Now we mark out the bladder. Uh, this is probably laparoscopically one of the hardest parts of the operation, because you can't put your hand in there. Um, and basically here, nicely, we've gotten some of the fat off the bladder. You can see your prostate here. 
and the, the robot is just uh, pushing the bladder downwards and now with uh, the other hand marking where we're going to go to get a margin in between the bladder and the prostate. We incise the bladder neck. Uh, this is the part laparoscopically you probably have the most bleeding. Um, an open operation probably is the dorsal venous complex that the stapler was on where you have the most bleeding. So this is actually cutting in between the prostate and the bladder. And now we're going to move up to the prostate and we're going to actually take, uh, this is the Foley catheter. So this is the bladder neck here. This is the prostate. And we've come across there. So basically we've, we've removed the part that's closer to your head. Um, and now the first part of the dissection was the seminal vesicles. Uh, now we've gone underneath the prostate a little bit and gotten back into that plane where the seminal vesicles are and we pull them up and that helps our dissection because we have uh, the side of the prostate dissected out, the top of the prostate dissected out and the first move that we did was actually dissect underneath the prostate. Uh, so all we have left is actually the lateral, you know, the posterior lateral aspects which are one is here and one is here. And those are easier to do uh, if we have everything else done first. So this is the, the seminal vesicles and the, the vas are going to pop into view in a second. There you go. So we've pulled those up. So now we can see that all it's attached by is the posterior lateral pedicles. So now taking the posterior lateral pedicles, uh, you know, this one is probably not a nerve sparing because we're using heat here. If it was nerve sparing, uh, we would use clips and then scissors without any cautery. Uh, this is an example of nerve sparing. So now we're not using any heat. This is just scissors. And you can see this is the neurovascular bundle. It's not one nerve that you can see, but it's more like a veil. Uh, so we're, we're dissecting all this tissue down while we're leaving you know, a, a nice prostate with a, a nice margin on there. It doesn't look like we're getting into the prostate at all on that. Okay. Uh, so this is, that's a pretty nice nerve sparing uh, as opposed to the other side, which we used hot. Okay. And now we're back at the front of the prostate. So we're going to take uh, what's called the apex or the part that's closest to the penis. Um, so we're taking down these fibers. Uh, that are basically a little bit of muscle that are attaching. The, the sphincter is going to be in here somewhere. Uh, the dorsal venous complex is up here and the prostate is down here. And then the urethra is going to be right about here. So even this is 2D for us, the surgeon who's using the robot right now has a little bit of a three-dimensional feel. Uh, and, you know, having assisted in these as well as sat at the console, the, the console you can do a lot more there than you can if you were assisting just because of that uh, the 3D vision. It feels like you, know, you can actually see around the corner a little bit. Uh, this is one of the main advantages of a robot. Uh, here you really, so this is the bladder here, and you can really see how the, the wrist is being used here. So laparoscopically, this is one of the more uh, nitpicky parts of the operation, doing the suturing, so putting the bladder back to the urethra up here. With a robot, because you can actually, it's almost like you have your wrist in there, you can actually do a lot uh, and achieve angles that you can't do laparoscopically. So we have the Foley catheter coming out on the urethra and now we've got the needle seeing where the urethra, the hole is, and then we're gonna basically take a bite there after you can see what's going on. We tolerate some bleeding here because the neurovascular bundles, we don't want to damage them with a the stitch or with, uh, with heat such as cautery to stop the bleeding. So uh, if it's a little red, then you know, it's not a big deal for us. So, so here you see the wrist action and we'll just speed it up. So let's say we're done here. This is like the, the baking show or the, an hour later. So it's more like 20 minutes. So, uh, so after you're done, this is the end of the anastomosis. That's probably the last stitch coming in here on the bladder. OK. 
Okay. And then we sew, sew everything back together. And then what we do, we, we put our final catheter in and we make sure that it's watertight. So you can, this is actually the bladder blowing up uh, with water that we're putting in and we make sure there's no leak where we've sutured the urethra to the bladder. So that, that's how you do a robot prostatectomy. You know, I'm not saying go out and do your own robot prostatectomies, but those are the principles of the surgery. Uh, you know, uh, oftentimes it can be harder than that, but this is just an example video. So this is marketing literature from the actual corporation, and they're saying, look, look at all the stuff that you know, we can do with uh, the robot that beats the standard traditional way of doing things. Now, you know, the internet is great, you know, I love the internet, it's got a lot of information on there, but there are certain things that, you know, if you looked at, uh, you know, advertisements for, you know, for example, HIFU or the prostate uh, robotic surgery, you know, things can get a little bit blown out of proportion. You know, um, I think because some of the marketing is from the U.S., uh, you know, things are, are made out to be a little bit better than they actually are. So the expectation is a little bit higher for these patients. Um, and so just not to pour cold water on the whole thing, but they're, they're probably in the literature, it's a little bit different than what they're saying on their website. So in terms of increased cancer control, I would probably say that it's about equal, whether you have it open or laparoscopically or with the robot, uh, you're looking at probably the same uh, ballpark in terms of positive surgical margins uh, or you know disease outside of the prostate that you didn't realize that sort of thing. In terms of continence um, anecdotally as well as in the literature uh, probably there is an earlier return to continence uh, with a robot or laparoscopic surgery as opposed to open surgery. However that's probably measurable in weeks as opposed to months. In terms of sexual potency uh, you know, this, most of these references are from one surgeon from Detroit, and to be honest, you know, 99% of urologists don't believe all of his data. Uh, he says he has a 90% potency rate post-surgery. Um, the best literature to date in men in their 50s who have great erections coming in is probably 50-50. So uh, it's unlikely that, you know, problems with erections are going to be a lot better with the robot as opposed to any other type of surgery. Is there less pain? Uh, probably. Uh, probably you have a faster recovery by a few days and probably you use a little bit less morphine uh, with the laparoscopic or robot surgery as opposed to an open surgery. Is there reduced blood loss? Um, you know, laparoscopic or robot, yes, you probably have less blood loss uh, than if you did it uh, through an open procedure. Now, you know, that's that's by and large, and that's partly the effect of what we call the pneumoperitoneum. When we have the, the carbon dioxide pushing on the veins, you actually lose less blood that way. Reduced complications, that's, that may be true eventually, but you know, everyone knows that there's a learning curve for laparoscopic or even robot surgery. So you know, complications are going to happen no matter what kind of surgery you choose uh, and what surgeon you choose. Um, so that, that was basically what the, the marketing website says about robot surgery. This is really more, I've got three articles that kind of show us, you know, probably what the real deal is with respect to robot surgery. So this highly experienced center in France where laparoscopic prostatectomy was first described really in France um, shows that going from uh, non-robotic to robotic surgery, uh, they actually liked it uh, and the continence rate was great at a year and they're doing these operations in two hours and 20 minutes which is great uh, and their positive surgical margin for organ surgical margin rate for organ confined disease was a pretty acceptable at 17.2 percent. It's never going to be zero but uh, you know you want it to be less than 25 percent for sure. Um, so these guys did a good job but they already had a lot of laparoscopic experience. You know, in Calgary, what's our situation? You know, most urologists uh, do open prostatectomy. Uh, there's a couple of us that do laparoscopic prostatectomy, 
Uh, and then none of us uh, have really had that much robot experience, unless you go back to my fellowship. Um, but if you look at people who go from open to robotic prostatectomy, you know, we know it's going to take longer. So we know the surgeons who are starting up on the robot to be safe are going to slow down. They're not going to be as fast as they were before. Uh, we know that the blood loss will probably be less. And we know that the margin rates are, should be the same. If it's a lot higher, then we know we're doing something wrong. Uh, and we know from their data that maybe um, the erections and the leakage of urine are probably a little bit better with the robot in terms of their results than with the open surgery. Uh, but that's only one study out of Italy. The best study we have to date, which is basically looking at all the patients in Medicare, so anybody over 65 in the US is on Medicare, they linked it to this cancer registry called SEER, which is Surveillance and Endpoints uh, Results uh, Database. So they looked at what happened over the years with respect to the robot. Uh, they know that six years ago, the robot was less than 10% of the surgeries. They know that two years ago, almost half of the prostatectomies that were done were done by uh, the help of a robot. In terms of the you know, long-term outcomes, and whenever we talk to patients, uh, and when, you know, whenever you think about prostate cancer, you should probably think about three things, you know, cancer control, leakage of urine, and return of erections. Those, we call that the triad. You know, most people are gonna have cancer control and continence, but as, as we know, erections uh, we're not quite as good with that. So we're looking at the robot uh, versus open, we can see that uh, likely cancer control is about the same. In terms of continence, they actually showed that maybe open surgery was a little bit better than the robot, unlike the previous study. And this is with thousands of patients, not 120. Uh, and the erections, uh, the function was actually it should say dysfunction actually. The robot actually had worse uh, erectile function as opposed to open uh, surgery. In terms of short-term outcomes, you know, how long you're in the hospital, whether or not you had a blood transfusion, and whether or not you had a narrowing or a stricture afterwards, uh, you can actually say that the robot is better. But these are only short-term outcomes. So we're not looking at the triad there. The author's comment was that Basically, we're looking at guys who have done tons and tons of open prostatectomy. Uh, so basically, he's saying they're like professional golfers versus, with you know, the older steel clubs versus guys who have basically come on the scene and started using the robot. And even so, the results are about the same, and there's short-term gains. And the author actually is a robotic surgeon. So what he's saying is, you know, despite the fact that you know, our study shows that open prostatectomy uh, is probably superior uh, to the most recent version of robot surgery. I still do robot surgery because, you know, I'm getting used to the graphite clubs instead of the old steel clubs, is basically what he's saying. Not in the journals, and this is a bone of contention, not only amongst uh, patients, but actually urologists and, you know, healthcare administrators is the cost. So a robot is about an additional $5 million over five years for installation, disposables, uh, maintenance contracts, etc. cetera. Uh, open surgery is not very expensive. You know, one case is probably less than $10,000 if you added up all the costs. Don't quote me on that, but that's a guess. Um, it's a loss leader. It's a loss leader in Canada, and, you know, I bumped into a... Uh, a guy who works at Wake Forest who does a, mostly robot prostates and he said it's a loss leader for our hospital but we have to offer it otherwise we're not a center of excellence. In terms of in Calgary you know some of the surgeons here can do three open prostatectomies in a day with a robot because their setup time and takedown time even if you were fast you probably only managed to get two cases done in a day so you know, if everyone is going to choose robot over open prostatectomy, our wait lists are going to get longer unless we get more operative time. The current standard is open radical prostatectomy. 
So if you were in you know, Lethbridge or Red Deer or wherever, uh, open prostatectomy is what's offered and that's what you're probably going to get and they probably mentioned to you as well that you could have laparoscopic or robotic surgery. Now, not everyone is trained in these things and there is a learning curve. So if you do pure laparoscopic prostatectomy, uh, they probably say it's going to take you about 70 cases to get really, really, really good. Uh, the robot sh shortens that curve and they estimate in the literature that, you know, you, basically it's going to take 12 to 18 cases to get you up to speed uh, and equivalent to everybody else. Uh, so the robot has an advantage in terms of the surgeon learning how to do the, the operation. So, you know, deep thoughts like Saturday Night Live, you know, Jack Handy. Uh, do economics override patient rights? So. Basically, if we have a limited pot of money, which we do, uh, whatever province you're in, is it worthwhile spending, uh, you know, that additional million dollars a year uh, to offer some patients a uh, robot prostatectomy as opposed to spending that other million dollars on something else, like, I don't know, H1N1 vaccination or something. It's hard to say. Um, you know, that's, you know, something that could be discussed. Uh, the other thing is, you know, this is more like Star Trek now, do the rights of the individual come before the rights of the whole society? So not everyone can get a robot surgery. You know, we would be inundated. Um, and to be honest, I don't think uh, we're probably budgeted to actually do 100% of all the patients with, ro with robots. Uh, part of the reason is anatomically, uh, we can't. You know, if you've had a hernia repair with mesh, no one's going to give you a, a laparoscopic or a robot prostatectomy. Uh, it's just too hard. You're going to get an open prostatectomy. You know, if you're very overweight, uh, most surgeons would be uncomfortable offering a laparoscopic prostatectomy as opposed to an open surgery. Most, most surgeons would ask you to go for the open surgery. So in the end, you know, the robot, while it looks great, you know, the video is enticing and the marketing is, is excellent, does the equipment really matter? You know, if you took Jack Nicholas playing with his old clubs versus Tiger Woods and you made them play with the, the same equipment, you know, they'd probably shoot about the same. You know, I think Tiger would still win, but, you know, that's just my opinion. Uh, right now, Tiger, you know, with his newfangled equipment, I would say is going to be Jack Nicholas, you know, nine times out of ten, if not more. So in the long run, I think the robot is going to be here to stay. Um, it's just a matter of the fact that, you know, we have to use it in Calgary, you know, get proficient, make sure we monitor our results. So in conclusion, we know the robot's coming, uh, thankfully to a lot of donors uh, that have given money for it. Uh, patients are going to have to decide what they prefer. You know, there are definite advantages of the, of the robot as opposed to a pure laparoscopic procedure. Um, and that's to do with the 3D and the, you know, the, the extra wrist, et cetera. Um, but, you know, a lot of patients aren't going to want to wait until February to have their surgery. And the differences between open prostatectomy and robotic prostatectomy, they're a little bit harder to define. We know the short-term results uh, are probably a little bit better in terms of hospital stay and blood loss. Um, less narcotic use and probably er a little bit earlier return to function. Uh, however, the long-term outcomes, uh, looking at the triad of cancer control, continence, and erectile function, uh, it would be hard to state either way that there's a huge difference. You know, if anything, uh, it's a relatively small difference. And so obviously, you know, we've got some time for questions. Um, I do have to, I am on call and someone's covering me, but I do have to go back to the hospital, so. Thank you very much for that. That was a very thoughtful presentation. We have time for questions. I'm gonna pass, I'm gonna come down with the floor mic so that everybody can hear the, uh, hear your question. Karen, do you wanna grab the other one? Sure. Uh, did you say that if you had hernia and there's a mesh, then you cannot do laparoscopic surgery? Or? It would be exceedingly difficult. The reaction of the mesh 
basically makes it very, 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 very hard to do a laparoscopic prostatectomy. And I just want to one more question. What's the advantage for a patient of robotic against laparoscopic from the patient's point of view? From the patient's point of view, probably the surgeon is going to see better. The surgeon has a little bit more wrist movement as opposed to none. Um, and the surgeon is, is, the main difference is really he's in control. Uh, with a pure laparoscopic approach, you're depending on two people. You depend on the surgeon and the assistant, probably who you never met and you're never going to meet if you get the surgery and you don't know who they are or anything. If you have a robot surgery, uh, you're probably, you know, the surgeon is contro in control of, you know, basically almost everything except for the suction and putting clips in there. So the surgeon does have a little bit better control. If you ask, um, you know, a whole bunch of surgeons who do laparoscopic prostates versus robot prostates, um, the true gurus, and there's only about three or four of them, would say, oh, I still like doing pure laparoscopic. You know, I'm great at it. I'm comfortable. It takes me an hour and a bit. Um, you know, I don't need the robot. I would say everyone else would say I prefer the robot. And, you know, the literature shows in the last few years, you know, laparoscopic prostatectomy has really decreased by about 25 to 75 percent as robot installation has gone up. Anybody else? Fred. Doctor, I'm concerned about the question of cancer that has left the prostate. Whenever you do open surgery, how do you determine whether it has uh, penetrated the capsule? Is it a matter of color? Is it a matter of touch? And then how do you transfer that into a laparoscopic room? That's a good question. I mean, that's a... Uh... If we knew the answer to that, then our margin positive rate would be zero. So, you know, we haven't fully defined that. In open surgery, you can put your hand in there and you can feel if there's a nodule or not. There's no real color difference. Um, you know, it's not, uh, unfortunately, it's not color by number, so you can't just go by that. Um, and really, it's, it's a game of millimeters. So you're looking at the cancer is actually usually quite close to where the nerves for the erections are. If you have a whole bunch of cores positive on one side of your prostate for cancer, most surgeons would not spare the nerve on that side and they would go wide to try and ensure that they're going to get a negative surgical margin. Now if you have you know, only one core positive on that side, most surgeons would say, well, I'm going to try really hard to spare the nerves, um, and that was the contrast. So you saw on one side they were burning through. Uh, the neurovascular bundles to go wide and then on the other side you saw this really nice nerve sparing where they hugged the prostate. Uh, now that decision really comes down to the patient, you know, what, whether how important the erections are to him, the pathology, because if you have one core positive out of 10 for 5 percent, that's a completely different story than if you have 10 out of 10 cores positive for 50 to 80 uh, percent. And finally, you know, uh, what, what the surgeon thinks he can get away with. Um, so, you know, that's a, it's a complicated question. If we thought that we had, you know, gone through the prostate cancer into the prostate, uh, either open or laparoscopically, uh, we usually come back and take a, an extra margin to make sure that we're still uh, in the right plane. However, you know, that comes with experience. Um, you know, open surgeons, because they've done a lot, and most, most urologists have done a lot of open surgery, uh, it goes, a lot of it's by feel. Uh, laparoscopically, we have the benefit of, you know, with a robot, it's 10 times magnification. You can usually see uh, if you've gone somewhere you don't want to be. So, you know, there's not a straightforward answer to that. Uh, it depends on the situation, what we're going to do. Anybody else? Um, I 
I bet there's over 300. I think Dr. Kozak does a lot of laparoscopic prostatectomy. Um, he's probably the only one uh, who's really doing it routinely. I know there's other surgeons uh, that are planning to use a robot. You know, in San Francisco, I trained on the robot, so I'm, I'm pretty comfortable uh, with that. The, you know, I do laparoscopic as well, um, but I think we're only the, the current two doing laparoscopic prostatectomy. But I think when the robot comes, there's going to be other urologists who do offer robotic prostatectomy. Well, I mean, you have to be straight up with patients. You know, you're, you know, you have to say, listen, you know, this is a robot. This is what the literature says is going to be, you know, the possible benefits. But you know, if someone asks you, you can't lie and say, oh, I've done hundreds of these things. You got to say, well, you know, you're going to be, you know, the pro the Patients are going to know. I mean, if the robot gets here in February, no one's going to be able to say I've done 82 of these things. Everyone's going to be starting, you know, uh, at the beginning or after a hiatus like myself. So, you know, it's, it's going to be pretty clear, I would think. If you're hearing differently, then, you know, you've you got to think twice. Oh, I think it, uh, oh, yeah, you've got to wait for the microphone. So we'll, we'll get your microphone down to you in a sec. Uh, we had a presentation here not too long ago, maybe last year or so, on, on this robotic surgery, and I, I got the impression that it was head and shoulders above um, the uh, regular type of surgery regarding uh, uh, both the uh, sexual function and the urinary function. Uh, would you care to speculate? Like, my impression is intuitively that once you get really good, that uh, over time there will be a noticeable edge between the robotic versus what you call open. Would you intuitively say that's true? I mean, you know, my first slide was uh, that I was probably a robot lover, right? So, you know, my intuitive sense is to agree with you that the robot, because of the advantages it offers in terms of magnification, 3D, wrist action, less bleeding, et cetera, et cetera, in the long run is going to be a winner over open prostatectomy. However, you know, if you look at the surgical series of the gurus in, you know, whatever country you choose, most people say the U.S., if you look at Patrick Walsh, Peter Carroll, who I trained under, their open prostatectomy series are unbelievable. You know, their positive surgical margin rates are under 10%. You know, their continence is great. You know, the erections are debatable, but they have exceedingly, you know, great results with an open prostatectomy. Now, if you've done 2,500 of these procedures open and you've only done 50 of them laparoscopically, you know, I was thinking back to my fellowship and I thought, you know, if my dad had prostate cancer, I'd ask Dr. Carroll to do an open prostatectomy on him. I wouldn't ask him to do a laparoscopic robotic prostatectomy because, you know, having seen him do both, you know, at that point in time, I thought, you know, I'd rather have my dad have the open surgery. Would you then say that the uh, robotic uh, pr uh, procedure then would, uh, see I think you're talking about certain specific guys that are really top of the line type guys and how many people can line up to have their surgery done by now? Three yeah. or four guys, right? And with the ro robotic surgery, does that basically spread the expertise from that very select group to a broader group of guys who will never get to that very select group on the open side? That the robotic surgery will, will enhance their capability to bring them up to that particular level? I mean, I don't think you're, you know, it's not, the difference that you imply, it's not like going from AAA baseball into the major leagues. You know, it's not like these guys are the only major league belt ball players in the, in the world. The, the difference you're looking at is probably, you know, between, you know, you could use a golf club analogy, but it's really just the tools that you use to do the operation. The steps of the operation are basically the same open, laparoscopic, robotically. You know, I think robot offers an advantage over laparoscopic. The difference between open and experienced hands versus, you know, relatively new experience with robot, because everybody's new, because it's only been around for a few years, uh, it would imply that, you know, there's nothing wrong with open, and maybe eventually robot will be better. Now, I can't tell you that for sure. Everyone's got to track their results. Uh, and see how they're doing. So, 
you know, you, you got to, you know, there are guys who are like, I'm never going to do a robot prostate. And I say, you know, that's perfectly fine because open prostatectomy is still a good operation. If they develop a sense of feel in robotic, that's obviously missing. You just have visual. Is that the, is that the next dimension that would enhance the robotic to the next level? Well, la any laparoscopic surgery, you don't have what's called haptic feedback. So you... you uh, with a robot. So with a robot, you can't actually feel the tissues. Even laparoscopically, you know, you can push on things and you get what's called haptic feedback. So if I push on the prostate, I get a sensation back of how, depending how hard I push. Um, that's lacking with the robot, but it's probably more than compensated for in other, other areas. So I'm saying if you could develop that technology, certainly could probably go that way if you needed it. Would that definitely vault it into another level? Yeah, I mean, sure, if you, you know, they're doing studies to look at, you know, can we fuse, you know, people's ultrasound scans of their prostate and overlap it on the video screen with their actual prostate. They do that for kidney surgery on occasion. These are research projects, you know, what we do now is not going to be what we do in 20 years. You know, this is, you know, it's a step in evolution. You know, we're not looking at, you know, the Land Rover Sport 2009, and we're not looking at the Model T either, but we're probably looking at, you know, uh, a car along the evolution of what we're going to be doing in the future. How are you doing, are you doing on time, Doctor? Um, I can probably spend another 10 or 15 minutes before... Okay. Uh, Maybe my question is two to the intervention for this group here. But it sounds like yeah, there are three different procedures. Open, the the right? Can you just really like briefly go through the three different different procedures? Sure. So just to, just to review, the question was about uh, the different ways of removing the prostate. You know, there's, there's a fourth called perineal, but almost no one does that anymore because it's hard to spare the nerves. Um, so... The, the three current forms that are usually used are open prostatectomy. We make an incision underneath your belly button that goes to basically above your penis, about that long, uh, depending how big you are. And then we cut down through the, uh, in between the muscles without cutting the muscles and then dissect out your prostate. We can feel your prostate. Um, there's certain things we might not necessarily see. So there are parts of the operation we do by feel uh, that we can see with laparoscope or with a robot. Now, you know, your catheter probably stays in about the same amount of time and you have to recover from the wound. You know, you're trading in a wound that's one length about that long uh, for, and for laparoscopic procedures, basically we put a telescope in uh, that's about the size of my pinky finger where your belly button is. So there's a telescope that goes in and then we use usually four other ports. So two are for the assistant and two are for the surgeon. And through those, we put instruments and we do the same thing. We dissect out your prostate, we take down the dorsal vein, uh, we cut through the urethra, we take out your, your prostate, hopefully sparing the nerves. Then we put you back together. With the robot, it's basically the same thing as a laparoscopic surgery. It's five ports. You have one incision because we have to take out the prostate somewhere about that long. And then you have four incisions, just like laparoscopic, where the incisions are about that big. So um, the recovery time is a little bit better because you're trading one long wound for this and a few of these. Um, but it's not a huge difference. So uh, that's technically what the differences are. In terms of the outcomes, that's controversial. So, you know, those three studies I showed you, you know, one study says, you know, robot's great after you've done laparoscopic. The other study says, you know, la robot seems to be better than open at our institution. And then the last study, uh, which has the biggest numbers uh, from the U.S. is saying, well, in men over 65, probably uh, the robot is better for short-term outcomes, but it's a question mark whether, you know, these novices on the robot are going to be better in the long-term outcomes of the triad, uh, cancer control, continence, and erections. Um, so, you know, the jury's still out on that. In the long run, I don't have data to back it up, but in the long run, I think, you know, a guy who's done, you know, 500 robots is probably 
uh, going to be just as good, if not better, than a guy who's done 500 opens. Hopefully that answers your question. Somebody over here. When a new technology like this is uh, being contemplated in a jurisdiction like the Calgary Health Region, why cannot those surgeons that aspire to use this new technology not work in a, an environment, for example, with Royal Alex and UA Hospital, where they have the robots already, uh, work uh, as an associate until he gains enough experience that he's very familiar with the, the ins and outs and, and also has the advantage of having somebody there to backstop him for those initial uh, few operations. Oh, that is what we're doing. So the, um, I know that, uh, well, I've trained on the robot already, uh, and I'll probably go to Edmonton or San Francisco right before the robot arrives for a refresher. Um, I know two of the other doctors have actually gone to a course down in Florida for a weekend, uh, and they're planning on uh, going to Edmonton or other centers. So basically, you're talking about a graduated you know, mentor program um, you know that's that's already occurring. No one no one is uh, got so much pride uh, or you know silly thoughts in their head that they're thinking, oh, the robot's here. Let's crack it open and start using it on patients. That's not going to happen. Just to reassure you. Yes. Are you saying that if you had a hernia operation 15 years ago that you can't have robotics or uh, laparoscopically? Uh, no, I mean, uh, if you have a, a, the other thing I should mention in the learning curve is obviously surgeons are going to pick the cases that are the most comfortable for them. So, you know, personally, I'm not going to do people who have mesh from a hernia repair as part of my first 50 robot prostatectomies. Uh, you know, I don't need it to be harder than it already is. I'm not going to do patients who are obese because it's a lot harder to do those patients laparoscopically. Um, you know, people are going to pick patients that they think are going to be anatomically, you know, a little bit easier and then get through the, their learning curve and their mentorship. And once they're comfortable, then they're going to start tackling things that are harder. Now, you know, there's never a, an absolute contraindication to doing a surgery other than, you know, infection or, you know, they're bleeding too much uh, because their blood is too thin. But in terms of, uh, you know, not to get fixated on the hernia or the mesh, but that just makes it a whole lot harder. You know, most surgeons that I know would say, well, if you've had a bilateral laparoscopic mesh put into, your, into you, uh, that basically blocks the road for us to remove your prostate laparoscopically, so you should have it open. And the difference is not so great that it's worth it, you know, if, if my dad had mesh inside him, I'd say, well, you know, you're going to have an open prostatectomy. It's not the end of the world. The open prostatectomy is still a good operation. Oh, there's a... Uh, the uh, evaluation of the results, open versus everything else. How much uh, is that done by an independent type assessment, or is how much uh, how much residual resistance is there by the open guys who think they're pretty good to the new technology coming in? Uh, depends on the survey. And skewing your evaluation of open versus the other. Yeah. So I would say that most surgeons still, most surgeons have, have actually converted the ones who have the huge case series. You know, I know my mentor, Dr. Carroll, has basically switched from doing, you know, all open to probably 85 to 90 percent robot. Uh, the reason for that is not necessarily because he thinks robot is, you know, awesome and it's way better than open. The reason is really the patients are coming in and they're saying, I want a robot prostatectomy. And he says, well, you know, if you, if you want to have that, then that's we have a robot here, and that's what you can have. So the thing, you know, I don't know what's going to happen in Calgary. You know, maybe 
patients are going to come in and say, I want a robot, and then we're going to all going to want to be on the robot all the time. Um, but, you know, maybe patients are going to say, well, you know, and I think this would be the smart mm -hmm. thing to ask. You know, I think you'd, you'd ask your urologist, you know, what do you think you're more comfortable doing? You know, which one are you going to do a better job at? And if he says open prostatectomy, and I was a patient, for damn sure I'd go for open prostatectomy. Carpenter is not going to recommend a nutrition to do the surgery. Yeah. It's just, uh, you know, you're looking at, you know, Basically, urologists are plumbers on human beings, right? So we fix the waterworks. And it's really, you know, we have a, one set of wrenches and now there's a, a newer and fancier and possibly better set of wrenches. But it takes a little bit of time to get used to that set of wrenches. Um, you know, you alluded to the fact that, you know, maybe uh, in another talk there was vast superiority of the robot and everyone should be having laparoscopic or robotic surgery. Um, personally, I don't agree with those comments. Um, the literature probably does not support that viewpoint. Uh, Intuitive Surgical, who makes the Da Vinci robot, probably does support that viewpoint, um, but that's biased. You know, part of your mandate here is to try and get unbiased information. So, you know, even though I'm telling you, you know, I would prefer to use a robot, in eventuality, um, not everyone's going to be comfortable with that, and I would say, if you like your surgeon, and he's a good guy, and he has good results with open prostatectomy, there, there's no reason for you to switch to someone else just because you want the latest and the greatest. You know, the, the extreme example would be HIFU. So high-intensity focused ultrasound, there's some short-term data in Europe, and now they're using it in Toronto in two centers, and you have to pay out of pocket probably about $30,000 uh, for this technology and they're saying it's minimally invasive and the website looks great and everybody survives and everyone's a winner and everyone's happy uh, except for the hole in your pocketbook. However, you know, the scuttlebutt amongst urologists is we know it's not completely benign. There are guys who have holes between their bladder and their rectum uh, and have fistulized after high food. So uh, it's not as benign as we think it is. There are guys whose PSAs are going up you know, after even less than a year after HIFU treatment. And we don't know if we can remove your prostate open or, pro open or laparoscopic or robotically after someone's, uh, you know, turned it up to over 100 degrees Celsius. So that's the extreme where we're using very short-term data. Uh, everyone's in love with this new technology that's minimally invasive where there's not a lot of data to back it up. The robot is a different situation. There is data to back up the fact that short-term outcomes are better. There is data to show that cancer control is equivalent. Uh, and the jury is still out whether continence and erections uh, are different. However, I would probably submit that's very patient dependent and that's very surgeon dependent. So some surgeons are going to emphasize, you know, we're going to make sure we got all the cancer and you probably won't have as many patients with erections. Other surgeons are going to say, you know, you have minimal disease and we can spare both your nerves very nicely and, you know, they may have a little bit higher margin rate, but they probably have more patients that keep their erections. So, you know, that may never actually be solved. But in essence, what I'm saying is, you know, you gotta, you gotta be informed and it's good that you came to this session, uh, but it's, it's not a clear cut slam dunk by any means. How important is the uh, relationship between the surgeon and the assistant? Is that a... Uh, it's a huge, uh, it's hugely important in laparoscopic, so pure laparoscopic surgery. It's, you know, you got to be on the same page all the time. In open, not so much. In robot, you know, you could probably have a medical student uh, doing the suction for you. It wouldn't be a big deal. Yeah, I always have the same assistant, basically, but... Yeah.